Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Cappy. Today, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Ben Hume. Ben helps people to develop their business within the health innovation space. And his particular focus is around sales and business development. He's got some very uh, interesting ideas around people, strategy, technology, and focusing on the right end of the problem. Ben, welcome. Marcus, thank you. Great to be here. I appreciate the invitation, and I particularly appreciate the chance to riff with you about sales, about business development, about solving problems, about asking questions, and maybe even about pirates, if that comes up. It sometimes does. I think piracy may well come up. It will come up. a favorite theme. Um, (laughs) Help me understand this. If we look at the big picture, take a macro view of what's wrong with sales, without going into masses of detail, where do you see the interdependencies that are either creating unnecessary and unwelcome friction, or there isn't enough friction in order to slow the process down? That's a huge question. Hang on, we're going to have to unpick that into pieces. My knee-jerk reaction is to say that sales as a, as a topic, as an industry, as a profession, is actually really big and complicated. It's a bit like saying, what do you do? Oh, I'm in medicine. Oh, fantastic. So you know about an aesthetic then? No, not at all. I'm a podiatrist, but I'm still in medicine. It, it, sales is, is kind of a very big, broad, wide church, and there are many different disciplines and skills and expertise in the market. And yet... Unlike most other professions, when somebody says, oh, we need to get a salesperson in, there's a whole set of assumptions that come with that about, about the skills, abilities, outcomes that person's going to produce and how they're going to be able to achieve something which everybody else thinks is a kind of black magic when it's just really actually not. Sales is really simple. You have to put it into the right context. You have to understand the universe you're working in. But sales is just about doing three straightforward things and doing them consistently well. And I think people get lost in the complexity behind it. Okay. I'm not going to ask the joke, how do you keep an idiot in suspense? You'll tell me tomorrow. So what are those three things? Firmly believe that step number one is you've got to find out and understand what somebody wants, what they need and why. So understanding what your prospective customer actually needs and why that's important to them. And then, and only then, step number two is also incredibly simple, is make sure that you've got an, an offer, a product, service, a solution that actually solves that for them, that gives them what they need rather than what you want to flog them. And step number three is you make sure that there's a fair exchange of value. And that's usually money, but it can be other things. But if I know really what you need and why you need it and what you can do with it, and I've got something that's going to do that for you very well, we agree a fair, a fair price. And that's how we that's how we can do good business. It is that simple. And I don't know why it gets so confused. And yet it does. Because we do like a bit of complexity in our lives. It gives us cause to go from one fire to another and play both chief fire officer and head arsonist. Yeah, I see that often. And I was inspired some years ago by two experiences in quick succession. Number one, this was probably 10 years ago now, but I was working in a big, busy corporate environment and everybody was, you know, working internationally and doing lots of funny hours and all that kind of stuff. And I found myself having this kind of automated response. Hey, Ben, how are you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Really busy. Busy, but busy is good, right? That was what I kept saying. I don't know why I said it. I just did. Those are the words coming out of my mouth. And then I heard a podcast, radio show, Oliver Berkman, who is a bit of a a writer and and does bits on the radio, talking about the importance of idleness and why it's valuable for us as human beings to sometimes just do nothing and be a bit lazy, which is a great little radio series. And it led on to a book by a guy called Tony Crabb, and the book was called Busy. And it delved right into this this psychotic glamorization of, of how being and seemingly overly busy makes people think that they're somehow seeming really important and valuable. And it gave me pause, cause to pause. <laughs> so yeah. it gave me pause to close my thoughts. And I went, oh, okay, I could do that differently. And I started changing my story. Very interesting. I mean, I had a similar epiphany a while back 
which was crystallized by reading Greg McEwen's fabulous book, Essentialism. And the book can be summarized in Do Less But Better. And my flourish to that is on purpose. Find yeah. ways to be intelligently lazy. So intelligently doesn't mean fucking up the relationship with the customer because you're cutting corners. What it does mean is cutting the friction out of their experience. Can you integrate within their existing system so it's seamless? Can you deliver at 3 a.m. on a Tuesday? Now, what, what is it that you're doing that is intrinsically more valuable than your competition? And how can you find a way to remove steps? What can you do to make uh, the expensive bits of your organization focus on higher value work? while the stuff that can either be de-skilled, systematized, automated, outsourced can be handed on to somebody else so that people are doing their proper jobs. Yeah, proper jobs is really is really key. And I go back to that, you know, well, you're a salesperson, therefore I'm assuming you're doing all these different things. Well, okay, I'm going to meet a team of salespeople. And Marcus, I'm going to tell you now that they are not one person. They are, I've got completely different experiences and backgrounds. Some are good at one thing. Some are fantastic at really getting under the skin of understanding what a customer really needs and wants and, 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 and why it's valuable and, and how to make the relationship work. Whereas others might be much more technically minded and just be, a, be an absolute guru on how our product can just solve the thing. And so trying to expect and force both of those people to do both of those roles means that they're not on their A game. Whereas I'm picking that a little bit and taking some of the complexity out and going, what are the jobs to be done here? How can we best use the skills in the team to get you doing the bit that you're great at and that you love and me doing the bit that I'm great at and that I love? And you're absolutely right. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we can automate and outsource. Though I sometimes see that that is another excuse for another project and therefore some more complexity to be invented by busy people. I'm, I'm with you 100%. The question that you asked is um, in our preamble is if you could only do one of those things and the others would never get done, which one would you pick? And it's kind of like looking for something similar because if I get a consensus around certain areas that, for example, customers want, that informs my product development. If I speak to unhappy customers and find out what really pissed them off, I can speed up my product development cycle by 600%. Yeah, and having those difficult conversations are, are the important ones, aren't they? Calling up that customer that's always going to have a chat with you because they like you is nice. Calling up the one that's just cancelled your contract and finding a way to have just that one really important question. If we, could, if we could only know one thing today, it's why have we lost this customer? And I see time and time again, I've been sat in those rooms where people are beating themselves up in the room getting at all the possible reasons that that could have happened and arguing with each other's guesses and not one of them picked up the phone and rang the customer and said, I'm really sorry to see you go. We want to try and get better at what we do. You know, please, would you just share with us what was it that, that, that was most disappointing for you or what was it that we weren't doing that was most important to you? It goes back to if we didn't understand what that customer really needed and we didn't give it them, then we've, we've not deserved to retain their business. And Sometimes that customer says, oh, no, nothing at all. Things have just changed at my end, right? We've had a change in circumstances. But people locking themselves in a room and beating themselves up is definitely not, not helpful in, in understanding what's going on in customer land. So I, I, I challenge um, anybody who ever hears that phrase, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really good, really busy, to come up with a different answer. Um, and I tried this on for size, and it was great fun. I started saying, oh, hey, how are you, Ben? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? And people say, oh, yeah, I'm very busy. I go, really? That's interesting. I said, I've stopped being busy. And they'd look at me. I said, yeah, I've, um, I've decided to stop being busy. And instead, I'm making more time for reflection and thinking and prioritization. And it turns out, I'm, you know, it's made me more productive than ever before. And people are kind of surprised and go, oh, my God, how? how how do you do that? How did you get permission to stop turning up for those meetings or ignore all those emails that weren't that important? Well, I suspect ignoring them helped. Well, I wouldn't know. I didn't read them. I mean, <laughs> what, can I, what can I tell you? I'm sure, the, sure somebody somewhere was crossed about something, but 
I'm also sure somebody somewhere was spending their time doing that one most important job of the day. And that whole prioritization question, Marcus, for me, you know, when people are busy and stressed and doing work, which in itself has complexity, you know, delivering really, really intricate solutions for complicated customer needs, there is a need of complexity there. But the process of organizing ourselves doesn't need to be. And so if there's 100 jobs to be done, and they're all screaming urgent and, and causing panic, that question about, okay, well, if you could line all these up, and actually, if you could only get one of these done, and the rest had to go in the bin and never get done, which would be the one thing that would be the most important thing to get done? And usually, pretty quickly, people can say, well, actually, that is top of the list. Great. So we'll do that now. And then... And then what would you do next? If you could do two or three more of these things, then two or three more, what would you do next? And people will very quickly say, well, actually that and that and that will follow. Great. Everything else, let's put that on the later list. And all of a sudden you've gone from having 100 jobs to be done, which may still only be doing, to having one problem to solve and really focus on. We'll do this now. And I've got an idea of the two or three things I'm going to do next. So the back of my brain could start working on those in the background. But actually I'm going to do the now task and it might change my view, right? It might change my opinion of the thing to, do, to be done next. What do I need to do now? I need to call that customer next. I need to send them an email following the call. But if I call them and they're not around, my next task all of a sudden doesn't need to be done next. And I can retick things. But making it simple, just divide everything into now, next, and later. I found it uh, revolutionized my approach to planning and list making and worrying. <laughs> Again, this speaks to another common mistake that I see uh, happening, which is the the least experienced people are being given the most important job in terms of building the list. It, it strikes me that we've forgotten or we've come up with heuristics to convince ourselves that what we're doing makes sense. I look at the least experienced people generating the prospect list is crazy. I look at all the effort and expense that goes into building a cold pipeline mm. versus selling hot or selling through the nurtured future pipeline. I look at the bodies littered all over the sales floor, the burnout, the turnover, the low percentage of people hitting quota. 85% of AEs not even getting 75% of their quota at the moment. Now, that's partly down to unrealistic expectations, I'm sure. But for a lot of them, they're just doing the wrong things and selling appallingly. And they don't know any better. Throwing money at training and measuring the retention level instead of whether the needle moved. A compensation system that focuses on new logo acquisition rather than the, le- uh, the longevity and lifetime profitability of a customer. Yeah, I, I dream of one day introducing an incentive scheme in a sales team that has some alternative measures on there. And I would love to have part of the incentive scheme tied to how much fun are you having at work? <laughs> or, or, you know, how genuinely happy is your customer with, with our product? You're in sales. You did not make the product. But how genuinely happy is our customer with the product? My, that, that my we pal Chris them? Williamson is developing an app called Askem because he's from Yorkshire. And you send it to them, uh, the customer before you arrive. And then they rate you on the basis of your performance and their experience as a seller. Yeah, that's really, um, it's really scary to ask somebody for that brutal feedback on, on the the bit of your job that you don't want your boss to see, right? Which you go to that sales meeting, you kind of mess it up, you stumble, you mumble, you get the name wrong, you sit up at the wrong building and they don't buy it uh, or whatever it might be. But to be able to say, hey, can you give me some feedback? We've met, we've had a 45 minutes together. Well, how was it for you? How did I do? If I could have done this better, what, you know, what, 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 what could I change? <laughs> you can't ask that. Nobody's allowed to ask that. But when you do... It's wonderful because you get some, hopefully, some really brutally honest feedback, right? That's the idea. There's no question there. Uh, The objective is to get that brutal, honest feedback so that you can improve. I've learned that 
that's a lot less painful than fucking up consistently over many years. Yeah, I mean, the short-term gratification in not being told why you're crap is tempting, but the long-term gratification in not being crap hopefully is, is more attractive when we have time to pause and reflect and get over ourselves and, you know, put the egos away. Yeah. Well, this is a useful thought experiment for anyone listening. On average, how many touches and dial attempts does it take to get through to one senior decision maker? And I think you aren't, you're probably into triple figures by now already, aren't you? Really? Well, to, to, get, to get through to somebody is around 33 dial attempts, unless it's a senior exec in IT, in which case it's 46. Hmm. Now, out of 14, how many do you reckon effectives convert into first meetings? I think you've led me with a question. How many out of 14, which is quite a specific number, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that the answer might be one, but I don't know because you've got the data one. and I haven't. Okay, so now you're talking 33 times 14 or 46 times 14. Yeah, it's, it's about 500, give or take, isn't it? Right. That's just to secure the first meeting. On average, one in eight first meetings, they're not only one in eight first meetings result in a second. So 88%, seven out of eight, do not. So hmm. you've spent 500 times eight, which is 4,000 calls, and seven out of eight of those times that you're actually physically in front of a customer, you fuck it up to the point where they don't invite you back. Now, surely it would make more sense for me to focus my attention on how do I convert that one in eight to two in eight to three in eight to four in eight. Yeah, definitely. The one that does come through, how do I make sure that that second meeting turns into business. I, Marcus, I, I hear a lot of, of founders, of business leaders, of sales leaders that come to me and say, look, how can, we, how can we get in front of more customers, right? How can we get more pipeline? And it's this kind of notion that, well, just get us more leads, right? Make some more calls, do some intros. Let's find some Double, that double down on intros. stupid, I call it. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely a place and the need for new, fresh outreach to start new conversations. But that is just step one. And spending all our energy trying to get better at that definitely misses the real opportunity, which is to convert good into better. Even that I would have to challenge. You've got four types of opportunity, ways to open it. One is you and I have been working together for nine, ten years. We've been on holiday together. We have done a shitload of business together. And I bring you someone because I've heard you complain about a particular problem that you can't fix. And I've worked with this other person. And I make the introduction because I believe it's a good fit. Okay, so that's option one. Option two is someone that you've been nurturing for the last three to 18 months. You know a dozen people in the organization. You understand where they are, how they got there, what they're trying next, and what after that. You've spent your time just being helpful, providing them with useful content, links, insight, and they move from passive to active looking. That's your second type. Hmm. The third type is, Ben, I've done a load of work with this chap, Fred. And I believe that um, he can help you or something like that the other way around, which is, Ben, I've been chatting to Fred and he suggested I give you a call. Okay, so that's the third type. And the fourth type is, hi, Ben, are you the person responsible for buying hardware? Which of those four are you most likely to buy from? Well, look, number four... You've called me, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping you'd know. Number three, I'm curious. That's, that's okay. I'm prepared to have this conversation. Number two, where we've been nurturing and learning about each other for 18 months, if there's business to be done and you deeply know what I need and you can definitely show me how you can solve it, then I'm up for that. But well, there's an if there, right? Clearly, top of the, top of the tree, if somebody that knows and trusts you can see you've got a problem and say, 
let me introduce you to my guy that will help you to fix that. Because nobody likes to make a bad referral. Nobody's ever going to say to you, oh, hey, what's that? you got a bad knee. You should see my physio. Any good? No, she's bloody awful. But, you know, I'll give you a number. That doesn't often happen, does it? <laughs> but people do like to say, you've got a bad knee. Oh, why a terrible knee. Do you know what? My physio is brilliant. Fix it good style. Let me give you a number. Because I feel good sharing that that with you and plus you're a friend I'm going to solve your problem and, and I know how much a bad knee hurts so I kind of care so yeah referrals instructions and networking is clearly always always going to be the prime and best route and yet today with particularly pace of change amount of pressure amount of stress in businesses so much going on sadly most of the companies I talk to and, and, and work with don't have enough of that available to them to capture the market opportunity that they know they can solve for. What do you mean they don't have enough available to them? They don't have enough clients to start with? No, no, no. So you'd look at, okay, we've, we've brought something new, innovative, and different into the universe here, which is solving a problem that people have been putting up with for a long time, may not even be aware of as being a problem, certainly didn't even realize that there could be a solution to it. Going into that market, you've got the whole of the world to go out. That existing network of referrals and instructions and recommendations might only scratch the surface of a small part of that market. I agree we should go there first. And we also right, how, need how to find get, a way to get to the next part. How can you get there fastest and most reliably? So I would go back to, number one, finding out what people really want and really need. So putting a lot more thought into Actually, what's a good customer look like for us? Because if I'm going to sell to, I don't know, acute hospital trusts in the NHS, there's a couple of hundred of them, but they are not all the same. But ha- so, given that you've got to do 33 dials just to connect with one person. Well, that assumes I'm going to dial everybody. I'd like to hope we can be a little bit more selective and okay. work out which of those are most likely to have the problem that we think we can solve for. Okay. What if there was a way that you could shortcut all of that hard work? Oh, I'd buy your hand off. Of course I would. And if you've got that golden ticket... I do. I'm going, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. <laughs> Go on, hit me. The, the thing is, you will say, oh, sounds like a lot of work. You don't mind work. If, if it's the work that's top of the priority list, it's going to get the biggest impact, i.e., finding those customers whose problems we can really solve for. And by the way, in healthcare, that's worth doing because when we do solve their problems, it makes the world a slightly better place as well. So who, who, who sells to the same people or same target market that you do and already has hot relationships with your cold market? Yeah, so there's going to be a whole range, and again, it depends which customers I'm working with, but there's going to be a whole range of either tech providers or consultancies or service firms that are doing good good work with, with these customers already. Okay. Now, if they introduce you to their most coveted customers and you do a great job, that means from that moment on, you will be selling hot. Yeah, I can see that. Finding a way to engineer those instructions. Is that, are we engineering instructions there? Are we, are we that cynical? Or are we doing something a bit more... Heaven more... Fend, we might actually work towards establishing common ground That's... and building a, a true alliance. A, you know, how, how do we work better together than we can on our own? That's a much better question to ask. Okay, so let's put ourselves in the boots of, say... A relatively small startup company, a few years old, uh, but doing something really clever. And their customers are big organizations, either global pharma or big healthcare system, something like that. Who sells those customers? Big tech firms, definitely in there. Mm-hmm. Niche consultants. At the same job titles, at the same job titles who commission or do the due diligence on their product. Ah, that's an interesting point. So yeah, probably not. Actually, you've probably got different people in a different a different point. Okay. So who sells to them? How can you identify which of those individuals are most likely to have a good human to human connection and be willing to take a call from a salesperson? 
Yeah, and so oftentimes, certainly in, in, in the worlds that some of my customers are working in now, that's quite likely to be the likes of consultants who have that trusted relationship and will either see a huge amount of value in these, 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 these tech services that can help them deliver their consulting outcomes or a massive amount of threat from them because actually if you buy their tools, you don't, you know, you, you kind of realize that I'm just billing hours here um, or you might not need as much of my stuff as a consultant do that. Right. There's, a, there's a risk going there on. There is the always there. that risk and reward. But there's overlap, so, isn't there? So first of all, you need to be disarmingly honest and you need to tell them that that is your fear and it may be a reason for you not to take the conversation any further. Or they can see it. They can see it as an opportunity, an opportunity in the future, or an opportunity missed. The opportunity missed is you've just passed up the opportunity to gain a competitive advantage in your crowded market and stand apart from all the other commodity providers, and ultimately potentially create a waiting list demand whatever you choose to from the market as long as it's fair value, yeah? Or you can carry on the road you're going and you get what you've always got. So my job is to help you make that intellectual shortcut and help your partners make that intellectual shortcut. In order to do that, I need to understand why they are doing what they are doing. I need to understand because you are in business for Ben Hume's reasons, not mine. And as a vendor, I'm just one moving part amongst your entire range in portfolio of products and services. So the question I have to really answer is how much downstream revenue can I help you hold on to, grow, or acquire because you put my stuff in that, and work together? That's really interesting, Mark, because I. I think what you're circling on there is a theme that keeps coming up in, in my universe where I'm working with, with sales teams in particular who are trying to crack into, into a market and where they are dealing directly with the customer. But actually it applies equally here where we're looking at indirect channel sales, partnerships, alliances, those types of things, which is they're banging on about you know, the features and the benefits. But what you were talking about there is how does this help you get to where you need to get to? That long-term thing that's valuable to you. And it's oversimplistic to say that, you know, salespeople shouldn't talk about pizza benefits, talk about value. Kind of, yeah. I think that was probably on the first page of every sales book. Doesn't understanding, it, though. Well, okay, another story. <laughs> um, we're taking the time to be able to understand what is valuable to that person opposite you, whether that's your direct customer or the partner. The principle is exactly the same. What is it that's most important to them in how we're going to work together? And what is it that they really want and need? And if what they really want and need is a broader customer base and more revenue, do I, just partnering with me, do I have an offer that helps them to get there? Yeah. And this is where the bullshit comes in because I see so many times people go, oh, yeah, well, oh, we could always, we could always say this. And coming up with a kind of logic sounding set of words is an argument. And I've seen all the sales training as well. Say these problem. words. Well, of course. You know, if you say these words, it unpicks that. Uh, what's the word? Objection. Oh, yeah. How do you handle objections? Well, just say this. No, stop it. Understand what the real barrier is. And if you can't solve it, say, you're right. We can't solve for that. Yeah. Because the alternative is 12, 18 months later, you've either invested a bunch of stuff in a relationship that goes nowhere, or even worse, you invest a bunch of stuff in a relationship that does go somewhere and it ends up in a really bad place where nobody's winning. Short-term pressure resolved, long-term problem created. And this is why I fundamentally believe you need to spend way more time in reflection, pondering the problem. And you need to do that not only on your own, but collaboratively. On your own is great. You, a legal pad, and one question at the top and no interruptions, 45 minutes, just churning out more and more questions. Because you're not going to come up with answers. If you do, you're lucky. But it just raises more and more questions until you get to the root cause. So legend, legend has it, and by the way, this is not a true story. This is, this is a legend which has been disproven. But Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. Feynman. 
Feynman, very smart, very smart cookie. Solved radio radio problems with the power of his of his brain. But uh, it's it's kind of spoken in the legend that he had this this famous problem solving algorithm, which I thought was just brilliant because it's actually magic number of three steps in solving the most complex of problems. Step number one, write down the problem. Step number two, think really hard. Step number three, write down the solution. Okay. Which works every time, right? I mean, we can, okay. we can go into well, a bit I more than that. that. We can't make it more complicated than it sounded I, there, but... but. I, I, I challenge that for the simple reason that we come with a bunch of biases, prejudices, fixed beliefs, and the real, the, the most creative and the best solutions, in my experience, come from throwing it into the melting pot, where people from different disciplines, different age ranges, different interests, different demographics, all throw their opinion into the ring. And you spend 90, 95% of your time thinking about the problem, working it backwards. Bingo. That's exactly it. Step number one is more difficult than it sounded, right? So write down the problem. I have been in so many of those conversations where people walk in a room, sit down, open the laptops and say, right, here's the problem. Let's spend the next 59 minutes arguing about the solution to it. And I say, stop. No, let's not. Let's just go back and spend 58 minutes working out what the real problem is. What's the actual problem that we really need to solve here? And the more precise you can be in, in, in being clear on what the actual problem to solve is and why it's a problem and how it's a problem and what the problem really looks like, as opposed to describing the symptoms of that problem. So step number one, right on the problem, that frustrates the hell out of people in meetings with me because they all want to jump straight in and come up with all the clever creative answers and solutions that... We don't quite know what they're for. So I do that exact same thing, Marcus. Let's spend the first 50 minutes talking about working out what the problem is. We've then got 90 seconds in which we can all shut up, look at that problem, think really hard and go, okay, yeah, the answer is quite obvious now because it will be. And to build on that, my experience tells me that most of the problems that you're facing the symptoms of today are the byproduct of unintended consequences of poorly considered decisions upstream. Well, I'm and, not going to prejudge the lunacy that's gone before us getting there, Marcus, but I sometimes suspect that that might have been the case. <laughs> How can I be so much more diplomatic than this? Yeah, sometimes that happens, and sometimes, because everyone's so busy, we haven't got time for this, Ben. We haven't got time to spend 58 minutes working out what the problem we're going to solve is. We need to just get out and get it solved. Okay. Well, I, I, I came across an instance last year where a development team had to put any solution in by the 15th of the month because they had to look like they were doing something. So okay. they spent 200 grand on looking busy. Yeah, and I'm I'm straight away going into my mind of unpicking what's the real problem here because the real problem clearly wasn't product features. The real problem was why have these guys got a need to look busy? I don't understand that. Who who is that? For? They've got an edict from above that tells them that they need to have their plan ready by the fifteenth. And this is where we need to start getting into picking on picking. What's the real problem to solve here? Why exactly. you know, that edict? What's driving that? What's so, behind that? And this is my point that you have to unpick it and go backwards. Absolutely. Because there is a multiplier effect of bad decisions over time. They compound and their impact gets greater and greater and greater. So it makes a lot of sense if you're a vendor or you're a partner and you're looking for partners is to think about, think as your customer. Where are they? How did they get there? Where are they trying to get to next? And after that, what's their plan? Because if you sell deep, you go beyond features, functionality, and price. And you offer hope. You offer a roadmap. Uh, you offer certainty and clarity. But the best salespeople move beyond that to how will this be transformational? One of my collaborators, and um, increasingly a mentor of mine, Simon Bowen, says that you need to take people from oh, to wow to ah. And if you can get them to the R, 
where they realize this is a moment to remember. This is a, a turning point. Then you've done your job well as a seller. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, I did take one tip of wisdom from one of those generic sales training courses many, many years ago, early in my career. And they describe this kind of emotional journey that you've got to go on. And if you go to meet with somebody, their emotional state doesn't move <laughs> during the course of that meeting. You might as well not have bothered. So this is the other thing. In, in terms of planning and preparing and thinking ahead for going in to meet with a customer, I'll be talking to a team that are going to go and do that. And I'll say, okay, so first question is, what, what do we understand to be your customer's objective from this meeting? What do they want out of it? Because that's super important. But there's the next bit, which is, okay, and what's our objective from this meeting? What do we want out of it? And, and, and to resist the urge to say, well, the customer's asked us to do this, 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 so that's what we're going to do. Sometimes it's necessary to go, okay, well, that's what the customer said that they want, but what, what do they really need and why? And what do we really need and why? How are we going to get there with them as because it's a journey? Again, overly simplify this by saying, if, if you go to meet somebody and tell them all the answers up front to all the questions that they might possibly have, they don't need to talk to you anymore. Well, but if you can make them think and challenge some of their assumptions and help them to see things in a different light, now you've got the opportunity to, 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 to show them something that might be useful. So is the salesperson the ideal of a salesperson today fit for purpose? Mm, I, I think that the old-fashioned notions of it, as we see portrayed in the films or in stereotypes, definitely not. Look, often people don't like to be called salespeople anymore. They want to invent fancy new job titles, partly because it makes people feel important partly because there's a negative connotation you all sales you're double glazing right you know dodgy used car sales because that one word gets you to describe all manner of things but i do genuinely believe that the way that we used to find a new customer and start doing business with them 5 10 15 20 years ago in certainly in the industries that i'm working in that's changed a lot our customers and our buyers have become in some ways much more educated and informed and more sophisticated. Um, and in other ways, they're operating in such frenetic, hard to keep up with, challenging, preferred circumstances because it's the 21st century and that's kind of how a lot of it is out there, that it's necessary to be helpful, useful, challenging. Um, if, if you know what you need, order it and we can do a website for that. You don't need to talk to me. But if you've got a problem that you're struggling with, let's have a conversation. If we can find a way to help you, that's the salesperson for me. It is, it is about, about solving problems. It's about helping somebody to, to, to unpick a problem that they really need to solve. And then the last bit, we don't need selling anymore. Let's just help our customers to buy, right? How can we make it easy for you to do business with us? How can we help you navigate your own organization or procurement systems or, or, or funding flows or whatever it needs to be to help you put in place this solution that we've just agreed on together. I think the most criminal act I see of salespeople today, certainly in my industry, within in and around healthcare, is where they leave it to the customer to work out how they're going to pay for something. Right? You said you want one of these. We've got one. It's really good. Go and get your funding and we'll sell it to you. And that, okay. I think, is a disservice, right? We should be helping customers to buy. Le leaving your customer unarmored and unarmed in terms of either the budgetary process, and I use an acronym CRAFT, commitment, resources, access, financials, times and timings, because those are all the elements of the budget step. Then you have the decision-making process, the uh, decision-making unit. You know, who are the players? Who is power and authority? Who are the decision-makers or the sub-decision-makers? Influencers, recommenders, specifiers, technical buyers, uh, user buyers, financial buyers. Now, some will wear multiple hats. Others will wear individual hats. Some will be anonymous. And it's our job to navigate all of that. And we need to understand the kind of pressure and attack that our sponsor is likely to be under so that we can prepare them for it. Absolutely. Are arming them to go in and and solicit the support of their decision making group towards their project is 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 really important. That's that's called being helpful, right? And there's another 
part of that, as you're describing that, Marcus, this, that wide group of stakeholders of the customer end, it's quite likely that assuming that the one salesperson with their magic sales hat on will naturally cover all of that is a bit of an assumption that needs to be challenged some. And where we, where we see the best, most enduring, solid business relationships is where lots of my team are working with lots of your team and together we're, we're going to solve this really well. And I do see that part of the role of the salesperson is to have that big picture view and understand it and that helps. We're a conductor of an that. orchestra. Exactly. Uh, orchestration is, is, is the, the phrase that keeps coming to my mind as well. And so that does necessitate a lot of internal communication and meetings and chat with your colleagues and all that kind of stuff. And good project management skills, good planning, good strategy. You need I mean, to, to drive action from people who have, over whom you have no authority or power, and you have to drive discretionary effort. That's a fucking hard job. I mean, it really is difficult because you, you don't have any of the clout. Yes, as long as everybody else assumes it's a salesperson's job to do this and they're doing me a favor, right? But if we, as a team, all recognize that we have got this common goal for the right reasons that we've all agreed on, this is the customer we want to work with on this project that we know we can do a great job on. And if your product guys are saying we should take that project on because we can't really deliver about it, then we really shouldn't be selling it, right? Getting the whole team on, on, on board and agreeing that of all the 101 customers we could be going at, this is the one that we need to focus on most in, first. In our weekly sales meeting, one of my first questions is to customer success. Is there anything in the pipeline we will not be able to deliver? And it's natural for product and ops to have some pushback, right? Salespeople are promising the air, ops are saying they can't deliver anything. We need a little bit of tension, a little bit of friction there, because I believe that both of those groups need to stress and test each other. Because hopefully, we're hearing what the customers most want to need now, not what they did three months ago. And hopefully, you're knowing what we can and can't deliver now versus what we thought we could have done three months ago. The last time we tried this and realized that some right. of it was, was more complicated than we, than we anticipated. And so it always evolves in, okay, no, it doesn't always evolve. If you're making widgets on a machine, it probably doesn't evolve that much. But certainly in and around healthcare, it doesn't stand still for more than a moment. Okay, so how do you... How do you establish effective boundaries and priorities in these relationships? Mm. So there's a, big, there's a big piece about the way that teams form. And I've come in my later life to think a lot about relationships and about culture and about organizational behavior and about the role that I play in setting the tone or, or stepping on toes, which doesn't always go down you know, particularly well. And... I'm proud to say, Marcus, I've learned a huge amount in my life from all the mistakes that I've made by doing it badly and doing it wrong a lot of times. Now I can see that the most important thing to ask in a team when you first get together to tackle a problem or to tackle a project or to have a meeting for 10 minutes or for, for the next two years or whatever it might be, is to go around the table and just ask everybody to be really honest and say, as a team, as we're going to work together on this, What's the most important thing or what's the most important things to you and, and to each of us? It may or may not be a work objective, right? It may be a personal thing. It may be your values. It may be about how we communicate. But for everybody to share, these are the top two or three things for me for this to work well, for us to work well together, for us to communicate and for us to enjoy the process. That allows you as a group to say, okay, well, let's agree. These are our, these are our rules. This is our charter. We're a team. We're going to work together for the next six months on this project. We may never see each other again. But for the next six months, as we work together, these are the rules that we've agreed in how we do this. Uh, you can call it a code. You can put it to the mass. You can do whatever you want with it. And it could just be two or three bullet points, right? Or it could be a list of 20 things. But if everybody in the, in the group has had their say and been open and honest about that, you've then got a way to hold each other to account. And refer back to that in every decision, every time you get stuck, every time things, you know, there's, there's tension and friction to scream, you can go back to that and say, well, how, how, does, how does this play out against these rules that we've committed to each yeah, other? Yeah, it acts as a filter for decision-making. It does, but it establishes boundaries and it establishes priorities and it establishes what's important to you or non-negotiable for me or that I wouldn't have even considered because that doesn't feature in my life, you know? 
but it's important to you. It's in the front of your mind every day. So creating that team understanding of each other. And by the way, that can be within an internal team or that can be sat across the table with your customer. Now, I've personally had a couple of great experiences where I've done that with customers that started a project. And whether or not the project's been successful, the relationship has come out stronger through the process. Very interesting. Unfortunately, we've hit the top of the hour, so we need to uh, wrap up. In terms of books, you mentioned, was it Oliver Berkman, Value of Idleness? So, well, Oliver Berkman did this thing on Radio 4 called The Importance of Being Idle or something like that, but he has written a couple of books too. One one's called The Antidote, which goes even further. I recommend that. And I recommend Tony Crabb, Busy. These are, these are two of my favorite books. That's about accepting that you can't do anything about it. So, you know, why bother? This is about slow down, take your time. And I think if you do these two things together, you get a lot done. You'll be super productive and a little bit happier too. That's important. Excellent. Okay. So you've got a golden ticket. You can whisper in the ear of the idiot Ben, age 23. <laughs> what one choice bit of advice would you pass on that he'd have probably ignored? So genuinely, if it is one piece of advice, I would say do not brake quite so hard on gravel on your motorbike. <laughs> Fair dues. Okay, good advice. So how can people get hold of you? Easy to find. I am uh, widely available on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Ben Hume, ben, oh, LinkedIn.in.benphume. Hume, everybody, is, is my business. You can you can see a website, contact me through that. Or I do hang out a bit on Clubhouse on a Thursday evening, usually around five o'clock. We throw up a room called Sales Piracy uh, and share stories about how to be a little bit more pirate and cause good trouble and break some of the old rules and do things differently, which goes in all kinds of wacky and wonderful directions, but has always got a good story at the end of it. So Clubhouse on a Thursday on Sales Piracy, LinkedIn, Ben P. Hume, or humeredwood.co.uk will always find me in the end. Brilliant. Ben Hume, thank you. Marcus, thank you very much. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've enjoyed this or found it useful, then please like, comment, share, subscribe, and tag someone who could benefit. Feel free to leave a negative or a positive review on Apple or Google Podcasts. And if you want to get a hold of me, Marcus at laughs Take care. Happy selling. Bye-bye.